How are y'all this morning? Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny he talked about the amen and stuff because I told my dad last night. I was. <clears throat> By the way, everybody is trying to figure out who my dad is. He looks like an older me with a beard. He's right over here. <laughs> I'm calling him out because I'm gonna talk. I'm gonna mention something about him in the message, something short, but I'm gonna mention something about him. But uh, everybody keeps asking me, <clears throat> how come he can grow a beard and I can't? And I told him, no, that's just hope for the future. It's coming. Like she said, what you expect determines your obedience. So I'm shaving, I'm grooming right, and I'm gonna get that sucker one day. It takes time, but it's coming. No, but last night I was talking to my dad, and I told him we started at 10. He said, y'all usually go for the two hours. I said, I'll tell you what, you come, I'll go for three. <laughs> Just for you. <laughs> no, but I do thank you guys for everything you've done for me, because it's easy for people to, I don't want to say it like that. That might sound cocky. It's easy to, to, to take when people say good things about you, but it's, I need you guys to know how good it's been to be a part of this family with you guys. Because that's one, you know, one of the worst things in the church that happens is when people start going through issues in their life, they jump out of church. They jump away from the people who are there to build them up and to love on them and show them and turn them back to, to God. And that is one thing I can say that any time I've ever gone through a situation, I've always known I just need to get here and everything's going to be all right. I'm going to get built up and I'm going to be refed, I'm going to be refueled, and I'm going to be ready to go. So thank you, and that's a hand clap from me to you on that. So I do thank y'all and I love y'all with all my heart. Also, love you, sweetheart. I was so glad Marty brought her up. That is my better half. That is my best friend for, for the rest of life and on into eternity. I'm so excited. I, I'm not trying to take all the time in the world, but I don't think I say enough good things about her. She is my head. I'm telling you, when, I, when I'm up there, I don't, I forget things. Um, she knows me. I'm 90 to nothing, just bam, and I'm one, I, I just get tunnel vision. And she has to help me say, hey, you got you to do this. You got to do that. You gotta, in fact, we got these sheets we fill out so that people, if a fire was to happen here, they'd know how many people we had. One Wednesday I was walking out. I said, oh, Lord, I'm glad a fire didn't happen because I didn't do it. And then she said, I, I did it already. I turned it in. I, Soulmates, you and I. Soulmates we are. But today I want to talk to you about something that I'm, because the church is going somewhere. The church is going, I, I told them this morning, the church is going in a forward direction right now. You can feel it. It's happening. Because I'm noticing all the messages from the youth group all the, to, to down here to upstairs, it, the, the church is going in a direction and the messages are lining up. And you're probably saying, so what does that mean? It means get on the train or be left behind. Because, I mean, some things are happening in this church right now. And, and, but there's something, there, there's a problem I'm noticing. And it's something that I have. And it's something that happens at so many churches across the world today. It happens at this church. It's in this church. And it's in the Baptist church. It's in the Catholic church. It's in the Methodist church. It is everywhere. And you know what? It's even not even in the church. It's even in the world. And it's something I think we need to reestablish, and that's simply, where is your hope? You see, we talk about hope, and what hope is, is a feeling of expectation and a desire for a certain thing to happen, just like Miss Janice was talking about. Whenever you have a hope for something, you start striving towards that thing. You start acting in a way to receive that thing. Hope is a trust into something. And I find so many times in Christianity today, we have a lot of people who say they, they, they know Jesus and they love Jesus, but their hope's not in Jesus. So the second a storm comes or a problem comes in their life, they bow out real fast. And I'm not saying that to guilt trip anybody. I'm saying that to say, where's your hope? Because if, if this is the God that I know, that you say that you love and that you know, then your hope should be fully invested into him. Because just like the song said this morning, he is faithful. That's non-negotiable. He is faithful. You see, there's a lot of things. See, in, in the Bible, what we've got to understand is that everything God says is covenant. It's going to happen. It's true. When God says something, you can take it to the bank. Even though we get to choose whether or not to take it to the bank. You can take that to the bank. 
And see, in the Bible, God makes a lot of covenants with people. God makes a lot of covenants with the Israelites. You guys know him. If you, got, if you do this, I'll give you this land. All you got to do is you just got to go in there and get it. If you do this, and he told Moses, if you go in there, I'll take you out. I'll, I'll bring you all out of Egypt. He makes covenants with people. But then there's awesome covenants that God makes with people that require us to do nothing. And that's one of them. You see, covenant is an, is an agreement. Covenant is like me coming to Andrew and saying, Andrew, if I give you this money, you've got to promise me not to give me a bowl cut when I come to you for my haircut. But see, there are some things, oh, I shook the hands with the wrong person. Me and Andrew had this thing going where when we shake hands, whoever breaks the grip is not the man anymore. A man always holds. That's why I said I shook the wrong person's hand because I knew I had to get back up here. But, <laughs> but then there's covenants that God makes with us where he extends his hand and he says, but you don't have to shake it. It's there anyways. And it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter how far you run. It doesn't matter how bad you are, how many times you give up on me and slap and spit in my hand. I'm always faithful. That's a covenant that requires us to do nothing but accept it. But I found that in life, so many people don't make it. Well, let me first say this. we got to be careful because when you don't put your hope in him, you will always invest your hope into something else. See, Jesus said that where, you, where your treasures are, there also is your heart. Which means that if you don't invest your hope into Christ, then you're going to invest it into somewhere else. Whether that's another person, whether that's a drink, whether that's a drug of choice, or whether that's just yourself, your own abilities, whether it's your wealth, whether it's your health. Because here's what we like to do. We like to get the, when, when the problem comes, when the tornado comes through, we like to say, well, man, I got my money to fall back on. I got my money and I'm fine, but and then you catch a sickness. Can I tell you something? Money can't buy you healing all the time. And then when that healing doesn't come, you say, "Well, at least I, at least I got my family." But can I tell you something? That, that life happens. People die. People leave this earth. Things happen. And sometimes, you, some people, we, we lean back on a relationship with somebody. We say, well, at least I have them. At least we're there. And it's probably the most destructive relationship you've ever been in your entire life, but you're putting all your hope into it. And I want to I take you guys to a story in Isaiah, and I'm going to kind of give you the front part of Isaiah. I'm going to start in Isaiah 40, but it's, a, it's an amazing, amazing story in Isaiah where the Israelites are getting ready to rebel against God. See, God kept bringing me to this scripture. He kept bringing me to Isaiah, and I kept saying, God, why are you taking me to Isaiah all the time? But I didn't realize that everything I was going through, God was trying to say, you're just like them. You're putting your hope in other things. Because, see, I was putting, because it's like I told Mario, I'll break my neck to go to the gym. I'll break my neck to make sure I go talk to somebody. I'll break my neck to make sure I go do this, but I won't break my neck to spend time in my word and pray. Because my value, I was finding my value in how well other people liked me. I was finding my value in my physical appearance, how well I could look. That way people could look at me and like me even more. I was putting all my value and my hope into things that will eventually fade away. The physical appearance more than anything. And we come to this scripture here, and I'm going to give you the first part. Because see, Isaiah starts out with Isaiah warning the Israelites. He says, you've been disobedient, you've rebelled against God, and you've been worshiping other things. You've been worshiping other gods. Because see, what they would do is, see, God brought them out of where they were. But see, the Israelites said, but you know, well, we got it from here, God. I got it from here. We're tired of trusting you. Because really and truly, they got tired of doing things the way God wanted to do them. Because they were a lot like us. We're selfish. We say, God, your way takes too long. Your way, I don't like it. Your way, why did I even get this cancer, God? You start questioning. You know the one thing about the devil, and we talked about this in college career, the first thing the devil wants you to do is to question the goodness of God over your life whenever that happens. Can I tell you something? It is God's nature to be good. There's nothing evil about God at all. As a matter of fact, let me just go ahead and put it plainly, He wants you to win. Whatever your situation, whatever that issue in your life, He wants you to win. The problem is you just don't believe He does. Because see, the thing is, we talked about it in college and career, that His goodness is His character. 
That's him. He's good. See, we make it out that sin can't be around God because we think that God just hates sin. No, it's that he's so good and so opposite of sin that where sin is death, God is life. Where sin is depression, he is joy. When sin is hate, he's love. And whenever it comes into the comparison of a, of a aggressively faithful and graciously good God, sin can't stand there no more. You guys getting that? Like, I'm not trying to like pry for a clap or nothing. But we got to understand, it has nothing to do with how bad He dislikes us in our sin because He loves us in our sins. The Word says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You don't go to a hospital when the bleeding stops. You go while you're still bleeding and you're you're busted open. You go then. (laughs) Let me tell you something. If you're waiting on that, you better be saying that prayer of salvation while you got time. I'm telling you. But we got to understand that he detests sin so much because it keeps his kids from him. Because, see, that's what the blood does. The blood of Jesus covers us so that we can stand before him free from that sin. Because God knows sin can't enter into his goodness and into his heaven. See, so many times, and, and this, this really wasn't even a part of a message, but God's going to let it be. Well, I say God's going to let it be. He wanted it to be. Let me rephrase that. <laughs> there it is. But we got to understand that He doesn't hate us in the sin. He hates the sin in us because He loves us so much. And He says, I know if they die with that in their life, I won't be able to have my kids with me anymore. Because that's the whole purpose of the gospel. That's what Jesus did. From the beginning of time, that, that was the gospel. At the beginning of the time, as soon when Adam and Eve sinned, that was God's plan from the beginning. He told the devil, as soon as the devil tricked them, as soon as the devil talked Adam and Eve into sinning, he lined them all up, all three. Well, that's this how I picture it. Like he lined them all three up. And you know how the story goes. He tells Adam one thing. He tells Eve one thing. And then he gets to the devil. And I love what he says to the devil. He says, you know what? This woman's going to give birth to an offspring. And later on down the line, you're going to strike his heel. But I'm going to tell you something. He's going to strike your head. He's going to crush your head. See, God already, on the first sin, he made an audible. He said, you know what? I got this. I'm going to work this out. From the beginning of time, he had it planned. He said, I'm going to work this out. And now I'm going to talk about something. Man, this is not even what I was going to talk about. See, instead of questioning God so much about why these things happen, it's like I always famously say, I never asked God why he died for me. I never really asked God why he, why he hung on that cross for me so that I could be covered by his blood and be forgiven and loved. But we look in the story in Isaiah, and they come to him, and they say, you need to turn from your ways. You've been worshiping the God of Nebo. You've been worshiping all these statues. You've been putting all your hope into other things because, see, the Israelites, like I said earlier, they started handling life themselves. They said, I got this, God. And then they began, to, they began to worship statues. They began to worship each other. They began to go around with each other's wives, and they just began to commit so many sins against God. And God saw it. He saw it. And he sends that. What I love about God is he always sends a warning first. See, God doesn't just come into the room like a kid kicking toys all around. He comes in and he warns you first, and he says, you need to, you need to clean this up. You need to clean this up. This isn't you. They, they can't do anything for you. And the Israelites did the most human thing possible. They said, no, we got this. See, I told Marty this morning, I said, so many times when I read about the Israelites in the Bible, I read about them and I say, what idiot would do that? I mean, they, I mean, you guys saw God come down and lead you by fire. He split the Red Sea and all these things. And for some reason, you just give up on that. And then I told Marty, and I said, I'm that idiot. I do it time and time again. Anytime God gives a blessing in my life, anytime he does something good for me, eventually I eventually try to handle it myself and take control of myself. And then here I am, just like the Israelites in shambles. But he tells them, he, he says, let me tell you something, Israel. He said, if you don't straighten up, Assyria and Babylon are going to come, and they're going to destroy your town. They're going to wipe out the kingdom of Israel. It's going to be over with. 
He didn't want to change their ways. And so verbatim how God said it, in comes Assyria and in comes Babylon and wipes them out. See, sometimes God will let you self-destruct so that you can realize why you need Him. Sometimes it takes you having your whole place set on fire for you to realize who God is in your life, to realize how bad you need Him. See, God let it happen because they had lost sight of who He was. And He had to let them know, you can't do this on your own. Because let me tell you something, if you put your hope in other things, well, let me first say this. What makes us think that we can fix the problem that we always start? What makes me think the guy who constantly makes the issue in my life, what makes me think that I can all of a sudden fix it now? Most of the time, I'm the only thing I'm good at making is another mistake on top of that mistake to fix that three mistakes ago. That's what I do. And sometimes you have to self-destruct just like the Israelites did. And I'm going to reference David real fast. See, we talk about David a lot. We talk about David's sin, and we say David was the biggest mess up. David did this, and David did that. But you know what David did do right? David knew where to put his hope in. David knew what to do when he messed up. David knew whenever all hell in his life was breaking loose, he knew the first thing he needed to do in his life. It actually says in Psalms, and so, Lord, where do I put my hope? My only hope is in you. Then later on when he's going through another tough issue, he says, why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? Then he gets the idea. I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again, my Savior and my God, because he knew that my money is not my God. It can't buy my internal happiness. This Bathsheba is not my God. Even though I tried to exalt her and make her one, she's not my God. He knew that his kingdom was not his God, and it was not going to give him anything, and that putting his hope in that was ultimately going to fail. You see, even David took his hope out of God for a little bit when he took the census. David began to get nervous about how strong Jerusalem was. And then he comes out and he says, you know, he tells his man, he says, look, I want you to go out and I want you to count how many men and women, everything. I want, you, I want to know how many strong men we have to fight war. And the guy says, you sure you want to do that, David? I mean, God's been providing for us pretty good here. I'd hate to make him mad. I mean, he's been doing I mean, but really, he tells him, he says, are you sure you want to do this? God has been providing for us. Why would you do that? Why are you losing hope in the same God that handed all these armies into your hand? Why are you losing hope in him? And David says, shut up and go do this. And he did. And God woke David up. Because, see, what David did was he lost sight of the same God who won all these wars for him. He lost sight of the God that delivered these people into his hands, and then he turned it to what humans can do. We pick back up in Isaiah. See, now we're in a time in Isaiah 40. We're in a time right now where the Israelites are in total destruction mode. And the first thing the Israelites do, instead of repenting to God, they tell God, you don't even hear our troubles. It says in Isaiah 40, 27, O Jacob, How can you say that the Lord does not see your troubles? Oh, Israel, how can you say God ignores your rights? See, he's saying, how can you say that? Because so many times if we would stop, if we would stop trying to rush our life, if we would stop trying to to handle it ourselves, we would see where God says in his word where he says, I'm here. We love to quote Jeremiah 29, 11, but we hate to walk it out. We love to say, for I know the plans you have for me, says the Lord, to prosper me, to give me a hope and a future, and never to harm me. Fix it, Jesus. We love to yell that, but we hate to live it out. We hate to read the Scripture. Just two verses down from it that says, you'll find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Man, we love to throw that one out. God's plan is always for your better. But when you're the one causing all the problems in your life, when you're the one cutting down your own tree, when you're the one cutting down, your burning, setting your village on fire, what is God going to do then? And I'm not saying this to beat anybody up. I'm saying this to me. I'm saying this to, to everybody in the sound of my voice. It's time for a self-evaluation today. Because in order for us to go deeper in Him and to go further in here, Him, you have to step back from time to time and take a self-check. 
Don't ever, for any reason or any circumstances, think that you got it all together because the second you think that, you got it all wrong. I tell people all the time, man, when people are talking to me about issues and stuff in their life, and I'll tell them, have you checked yourself? Have you evaluated yourself? Are you holding back unforgiveness from somebody? I mean, what, what are you, are you praying? Are you reading? You always first need to check yourself. Even David talks about, David talks about in Psalms 119, he says, I incline my heart to you. What he's saying there is there, there's times where his heart is in decline mode. There's times in his life whenever his health is failing and his heart begins to decline. And then whenever you don't have, whenever you don't have enough money, your heart begins to decline. And then whenever things aren't going right, you can't make your house payment or your house needs all the work in the world done to it, preaching to me and you, Ron, needing all the work done to it, and your heart starts to decline. But he says, I make the conscious choice to incline my heart to you. And see, the Israelites did not incline their heart to God. They questioned God. They said, why is this happening? You don't even hear our prayers. You don't even hear us. And God's saying, I tried to tell you that your hope was in the wrong thing. See, the Israelites, they just couldn't get the picture that God was a good God like we were saying earlier, that He's just so magnificently good. All they were looking at was the destruction in their life. And let me say this. Just because something bad happens in your life doesn't mean it's got to be bad for your life. It's time for us as Christians to stop looking at everything that comes down the pipe and saying, oh, woe is me, this is bad, this is, this is destruction. No. Maybe you need to have your hope built. As a matter of fact, let me give you some scripture for that because I came locked, cock, and ready to rock today. <laughs> it says, it says in James 1, starting in verse 2, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Some of you right now are checking out great joy. Yeah, okay. Divorce ain't great. It can, it, it, it can be okay. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. You understand that? Because see, what the Israelites did, instead of going to their God, they went to fortune tellers. They went to all these other people, and they were going to other people for their hope. And they were saying, tell me something about my future. Tell me something about this. What do I need to do? What do I need to do with my life? And let me tell you something, there's nothing wrong with going to people, but you better be going to the right people. And even then, if you're going to the right people, there comes a time where you got to start getting in your word. You got to start picking up your sword. You got to start doing it yourself. Because then you'll start being just like the Israelites. They didn't trust God. They trusted man. They trusted what he had to say. You know, when the Bible talks about the sword, do you guys understand that the sword that they're talking about is not this massively long sword? No, it's a short sword with a sharp tip. You know what that sharp tip's for? For digging out arrows when you got hit in battle. You guys catching that? You guys catching that? When, I'm, when my hope feels lost, I'm going to dig that arrow out. When, when, when sadness is hitting my life, I'm going to dig that arrow out because the Word says the joy of the Lord is my strength and that God is always faithful. When I got sin in my life, I'm going to dig that arrow out because God says He is faithful and He is forever merciful and His love will last forever. And He says also in Isaiah, I'm not going to get there, I'm going to save that Scripture because that one's going to wreck your world. It's going to be good, I'm telling you. But you guys get it? That word is to pull them arrows out of you. See, so many times we look at the word and we go, it makes me feel bad. No, it, it tells you where you need to straighten up. I know it does for me. It tells me where I need to straighten up, and then it pulls them arrows out of me. And then it says in Romans, we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance, and endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us because He has given us His Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with His love. I'm going to go back to that in just a second. 
See, the Israelites, they were putting all their hope in these things. They were putting all their hope in these idols. They were putting all their hope in their money and what they can do. And now they lie in shambles, and now they're questioning God. And then God looks at them, and he says this. For I hold you by your right hand. I, the Lord, your God, and I say to you, don't be afraid. I am here to help you. Though you are a lowly worm, O Jacob, don't be afraid, people of Israel, for I will help you. I am the Lord, your Redeemer. I am the Holy One of Israel. He's trying to make a statement. He's trying to say those things didn't do what you thought they did. I created the heavens and the earth. I hung the moon and the stars. I set the planet in its orbit. I put the earth on a perfect axis. That way it could hold, that gravity could hold still. I did this. In the middle of their questioning, he still told them, for I hold you by your right hand. Where's your hope? And then I love what God does here. You know, when you read the Bible, you find out God almost has a sarcastic sense of humor. And he tells them, in Isaiah 41, 21 through 24, because they're still kind of having issues. They still want to argue with God. And then now God says, all right, I got you. Present the case for your idols, says the Lord. Let them show what they can do, says the king of Israel. Let them try and tell us what happened long ago so that we may consider the evidence. I'm going to stop right there. You know what he's doing there? He knows. God knows your idols, they're not going to speak. They're not going to help you. He knows. But he knows that if they could speak what they would tell him, that it was you who split the Red Sea, that it was you who hung the moon and the stars, that it was you that stopped the sun over a mountain for almost a full day so that we could fight and win this war, that it was you, God, who delivered these armies into our hands. Because God knew. He said if, they could, if those things could speak, he was making the Israelites think about something who it was that did something in their life. How many of you need to remember that God is the same God that he was in the middle of your mess a long time ago that he is today, and then he will forever be that same God that he was then? Sometimes we got to dip back off into places we don't want to go to just, just to remember the goodness of God over our life. Sometimes we got to dip back off into the places of our life that we hurt and that we hated life, but then we remember God's faithfulness in those moments. And he says, tell, let them tell us what the future holds, because he's about to tell them what the future holds, so we can know what's going on. Yes, tell us what will occur in the days of head, the, uh, days of, ahead. Then we will know that you are God's. And this is what I love what God does. In fact, do anything, good or bad, breathe, tip over. I don't just do something. Because he's basically, he's looking at him and he's saying, do you see this? In, in the most loving way, too. That's the great thing about God. He's so gentle and he's so loving. And he's saying in the most loving way, are you seeing this? Your statue can't even tell you what happened. It can't even breathe. You don't even see its chest moving. What's the, it can't do anything. Do something that will amaze and frighten us, but no. And man, I love this about God. I love this. Because see, what we got to understand here is that the devil was tricking them into believing in an idol. So in, in reality, the devil was in that idol. He was behind that idol the whole time. And I love what God does. He's talking to the idol, but he's talking to the devil himself. He says, but no, you are less than nothing and can do nothing at all. Those who choose you pollute themselves. It's like I used to tell people all the time. They say we we used to. I used to have people come up to me and say, "Why can't I just, you know, pop a Xanax or take drink this drink to make me feel better and do this?" And I finally I told one person. I said, "Because there's something behind that that's stronger than you'll ever be. There's always something. About you ain't going. I'm telling you, you on your own, you will not outbeat the devil. You won't beat him." And I told him, I said, "There's something behind that more than what that's stronger than you." And God's telling the devil, he's saying, you are nothing, you are less than nothing. Less than nothing. Just know that, that the thing that is causing you problems in your life, that you seem to put your hope into, that if you, if you turn your eyes to the Father, you'll see that that thing that's causing you harm in your life is less than nothing. And can do nothing when you're putting your hope in God. Do you get that? He is less than nothing. But so many times we, for some reason, still put our hope in them. And then here's the bad part. When we do come to put our hope in God, for some reason, we like to think that all of a sudden God hates us because then there again the devil is trying to trick you into tr trying to make you question God's goodness over your life. 
Can I tell you something? If God draws you to repentance, if God tells you you're forgiven, when you come to him, quit acting like you're not forgiven. There comes a point in everybody's life, every Christian's life, where we got to start walking like we're saved. We got to start acting like we are for the forgiveness that we are. We got to start pursuing that. Christ said, seek peace and pursue it. But we don't want to do that. We just want to walk around and mourn over our issues. And God's saying, Dad, I'm not forgiving that. I'm over that. It's over with. Pick up, remember a couple of my, one of the first measures I spoke up here? Pick up your mat and walk. The man at the pool of Bethesda, when God walked up to him, he said, you're healed, now pick up your mat and walk. That man had the option to stay there. Because God was now putting the ball in his court. He said, your healing is there. Your grace is there. Your mercy is there. Your forgiveness is there. Your joy is there. Your hope is there. Now you pick up your mat and let's walk. But so many times we stay right there. And so God finally comes to him and he says, let me tell you something, Israel, from eternity to eternity, I am God. And no one can snatch you out of my, anyone out of my hand. No one can undo what I've done. No one can snatch you out of the hands of the Father. Not yourself, not your sin. Nothing can snatch you out of His hands. You guys get that? Somebody who's going through something today, you need to know that. That nobody can snatch you out of His hands. I don't care how bad you think you are. I don't care how much wrong you think you've done. And I don't care how bad your marriage is. I don't care how bad you may have treated somebody. No one can snatch you out of the hands of God Almighty. And so, Lord, where do I put my hope? My hope is only in you, referring to David again. And then they question him one last time, and I love what God says here. He says, do you question what I do for my children? 45, 11 through 12, this is what the Lord says, the Holy One of Israel and your Creator. Do you question what I do for my children's children? <laughs> I'm not even going to go any further. I'm just going to put it right there. See, they kept questioning him. They kept saying, God, but how can I put my hope in you? How can I do these things? How can And then yet in the middle of everything they've done, in every way that they've abandoned God, in every way that they've turned around and said, God, I don't want you, I don't need you, I'm going to put my hope in this. He says, do you question what I do for my children? You are still his child. He is still on his throne, and he still loves you. Point blank. You can't argue it. It's non-negotiable. It doesn't matter what argument you bring before God, you will lose that argument because his love trumps your, your unforgiveness over yourself any day of the week. See, we got to realize that we're talking a lot about forgiveness, but it's so pivotal. It's literally so pivotal because that, that is something that over time we have to keep referring to because the human nature, it, it, it just beats itself up. And it just says, I'm, I, we question His grace so much. But we've got to understand that His grace is what keeps us going. It's the fuel to us. You know, one of the things... One of the things we got to realize about life, and this is what I was talking about with, with my dad. My dad tried to teach me something so many times that I never would get it. Never would get it. Pop, you always told me, look at him. He, he opened his eyes. He said, which one are you going to now? I mean, there's a list. <laughs> dad used to tell me all the time, son, you need to have money put up. Because it's not if, it's when something happens to your house, when something happens to your vehicle. And, man, I never put money. I put money up, but it was always in restaurants and in clothes. And, and somehow when I came back to get my money, they never had it anymore. But he kept saying, son, you got to keep money because these things are going to happen. And I never did, and I'm starting to realize it now. Thank you, Pop. It's not if, it's when things happen. Because that's just part of being a homeowner. That's part of owning a vehicle. They were made by human hands. They age, they wear out, they break. you got to be ready for that. And it's the same thing with life. 
It's not if, it's when things happen. God never said nothing was going to happen, but he said, if you trust in me, I'll be there to walk with you through it when it does happen. Because you guys got to understand, there has to be something in life that challenges us. There has to be. Without it, our faith isn't genuine. Don't you understand that was the whole purpose of the tree in the beginning of the book? You know, we look at that and we say, well, the first question we want to ask God is, why did you put the tree there? Why couldn't you just made everything just holy and righteous? And that's because there has to be another option for it to be authentic. There has to be another option in order for your love for Him and your faith in Him to be true and authentic. Because, see, don't you realize Eve wasn't attracted to the bad side of the tree. She was attracted to the good side of the tree. And that's what the devil likes to do. He likes to shine it up and make it look like it's all good and nice and everything. But it says that she, because the devil tempted her, and he says, God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God. She was attracted to the good side of it. It always looks good. But can I tell you something? The devil, if, you, if the devil has to talk you into something, it ain't good. <laughs> it ain't good. But we got to understand that you can be rest assured that when you make it past that tree, another tree's planted. There's going to be another tree in your life. But it's not to break you, it's to make you. These things are faith builders, not faith killers. That's why he says, count it all joy when you enter these various trials and tribulations. And then Jesus, I love what he says in Isaiah 11, 1, he looks at him and he says, out of the stump of David's family will grow a shoot. Yes, a new branch bearing fruit from the old root. See, this is the part that I like because he, he uses an illustration that when Israel gets taken down, they're going to look like that of a tree that's been cut and burned. But he says, out of that burned up stump, there's going to be a shoot that comes out. And he's going to be a light to the world. He's going to bring hope to the hopeless. Healing to the sick, and he's going to open the blind eyes. He's going to break the chains, and he's going to come in, and he's going to set you free. He was giving them hope for the future. See, the great thing about that is now, see, Jesus Christ came and died on the cross so that we could have relationship with him. We have to understand that. You know, I used to hear people talk about the cross, and I used to go, okay, guy, I've heard this message. I used to say, you know, we know the story, but then I didn't really understand it. See, in the Old Testament, only certain people could go before God. And then they had to go through a ceremonial cleansing. They had to go through all these processes to go in there because anything that represented death could not be before God because sin is what brought on death, and the wages of sin is death. So therefore, sin and anything opposite of God couldn't be in His presence. And I used to question that, and then I realized that the cross did so much more then just give us a right to say we're going to heaven. No, when he took on the ultimate sacrifice for our sins, he made a way for us to not have to go to Pastor Marty to go take our problems to God. I don't have to go to Andrew to take my problems to God. I don't even have to take a shower three times a day and then go pray. I can just go straight to him. Because that's what it was. When he died, he opened up the way to say, you can come straight to me because I want to talk directly to you, my child. And that's what he was telling him. He said, just hold tight. He tells him, just hold tight because there's going to be something that comes out of this, something good. See, in the middle of, in, even before the destruction happened, he told them the future. But I love it. In the middle of that, he says, out of you, there's going to come a hope. I'm here to tell you that there is going to come a hope out of this situation because it says in Romans that not some things, but all things work out for the good of those who trust in God and are called according to his purpose. All things. He can turn that bad divorce into something beautiful. He can turn that, that cancer into something amazing. He can turn that anger into love, and he can turn that, that, that sadness into joy. I'm telling you, that was the whole purpose of Jesus Christ coming in today. If the church is going to move forward, we got to know where to direct our hope. My hope cannot be found in money because eventually that goes away, and I don't have a lot of it. I can't rely on my health all the time for my hope because my body's going to wear down. I'm carnal. I can't put my hope in a person. I can't even put all my hope in my fiance. Why? Because she's human. And people will hurt you even when they don't mean to. Because we're people. But God, 
who is the creator of all things and knows all things and has called all things to work together for His purpose, who can handle everything for you, calls you to put your hope in Him. Let's stop living in the land where Christians jump off the train because they just quit putting their hope in God. That's where we fall off because the bad thing is we jump off the train and then we question God why He's not showing up. That's like an alcoholic saying, God, why do I have liver failure? Or a smoker saying, why, are my, why can't I breathe? You getting what I'm saying? You can't be doing the harm to yourself and then questioning God while it's happening. we got to start shifting our focus and our hope to Him. I'm not trying to be overly real about this, but at the same time, we got to start being real about these things. I'm so tired of seeing God get blamed for everything when all He's done His whole life is extend an open arm and an open palm to everybody even when they've run from Him. And what I love, I love when I read the disciples, man, Miss Tina, can you mind coming? It's my favorite part right here. Y'all know when that piano starts going, we fix and get preaching now. It's like the music before a football game, you know, you start bouncing and bobbing and weaving and you're ready to go. I used to know a guy who'd say it's wig splitting time. <laughs> Let's just say it's tail tucking time. Let's tuck the devil's tail and run him on out of here real fast. What I love is when I read about the disciples, they also didn't understand anything that Jesus told them. Jesus would tell them all these things, and Jesus would talk to them. And, he, and I mean, Jesus would point blank tell them, I'm going to die and I'm going to raise this, this temple up in three days. And Jesus came proclaiming the gospel, and he came preaching to everybody. And, he, and his message was simple. It was love and exactly what God told the Israelites right there in Isaiah, turn your hearts back to him. See, the Pharisees that Jesus went after, he still loved them. He still loved the Pharisees. You know, we look at them like the bad guy, but Jesus still loved them. But the only thing is their hope was in their appearance and what people thought about them, their royalty. The Word says, in fact, Jesus talks about them and says, you pray in streets hoping that people see you. You adorn yourself in all these, these fragrant perfumes and all these tassels because you want people to see you and then praise you. That's where their hope was. His message was simple. Turn your heart to Him. Put your hope in Him. Stop putting it in these things that are in the end going to fail you. Because can I tell you something? If you have an issue when you finish that drink, it's still going to be there. When you're stressed and you smoke that cigarette, it's still going to be there. When you rely on that person, that problem's still going to be there. But I have a God that I know with all my heart is faithful. I've done had a dad that's had open heart surgery. I've had a mom who's had cancer. Trust me, I know what it's like to go through the fire and then have to trust in God for some stuff. And I'm not saying this to brag on myself. There came a point in my life where I had to realize who my God was. And I'll never forget when I got those phone calls, the first thing I did was I walked outside to stump the devil and I said, God, you're good. I don't care what the situation says. I don't care what the doctor's saying, how it looks. I know without a shadow of a doubt that you're good and you're in control. And I'm not going to, it's yours. And as you can see, my pop is standing here and my mom is standing here right now. Because I had my hope in the right place. Can I tell you something? When you put your hope in other things, or, or when... When you put your hope in other things, you hinder your prayers, guys. You can't hold hands with this God and then try to shake and then try to hold hands with him either. Remember that? He's too good for that. He's not going to let those things come up with him. He no. You can't hold hands with the world and try to hold hands with God at the same time. And I'm not so much talking about sin, but that is in there. I am actually talking about sin as well. But what I'm trying to get us to realize this morning is that when these things come, and they will, they will, you want your prayers answered effectively in the right way, not always your way, but the right way, put your hope in Him. 
the ever faithful. You know what I love? And hand clap to the praise team. Man, give them a hand clap. Because the song, that last song they played, I requested that and asked could they play it. And they, being the most talented worship team ever, were able to put it together and do it. But I wanted that song because it's a simple proclamation of a person kneeling down in the middle of a battlefield after the war has been fought and all these shambles are all around them. They're looking and they're saying, God, you're faithful. You are faithful. And then they're standing and, and, and the battlefield represents the tough times. It represents the times when you feel like your faith is taking so many shots and you don't know if you can go any further and they're simply just on their knees on a battlefield in shambles saying, God, you are faithful. And in essence, they're saying, God, you are my hope. Life will come back to these lands. But you know what else they did? It says even on the mountaintop they proclaimed that He's faithful. Your hope has to constantly be in Him if you want to go deeper in Him. And what I love is we have a comforter in Jesus Christ who came and died so that we, as I said earlier, wouldn't have to go to Marty, wouldn't have to go to Andrew or have to go to a high priest. We can just go directly to him. And what I love is God told, tells the disciples, it's the last thing he says, and it's so beautiful. He says, I've told you all this so that you may have peace in me. See, he was trying to tell them, I'm going to leave. Things are going to happen. Don't give up hope. Don't give up anything. I've got this. I've got this. And then he says, here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. There it is. There it is. The tell all end all. There's no need to argue that. He came and he walked. He was tempted. And he says, but take heart because I have overcome the world. I don't have a problem in this world anymore now. Because I know that the God that I serve, that I call on, has already overcome this world. And I know that sooner or later he's coming back for me. And then as Isaiah says, that you're going to look at the devil. And you're going to say, that's the thing that tormented me. That's it. Oh, and I have a feeling in that, in that instant you're going to realize, again, I was that idiot, just like the Israelites. If you would stand with me this morning. I love Jesus. I love him so much because I, I, I just love his character because he's gentle when he needs to be. He knows, He knows because we're all different people. Some of us need a kick in the hind end to get going, and he can be that God if he has to, just like Marty said. Some of us, we just need a gentle touch, and he can be that God too that just reaches down and gently touches you. He knows all your intricate details, and I love that about him. And you know what I really love about it is that in Psalms it says that he knows the the numbers of hairs that are on my head and also says that his thoughts towards me outnumber the grains of sand of the sea and that doesn't mean that because he's so powerful that he has to do that it's because he chooses to do that he chooses to look down and count your hairs he he chooses to know you that personally because he's such a loving God and I wanted to speak this message this morning because God, I know He laid it on my heart and He was telling me, in order for you to go deeper and to do what I'm calling you to do and in order for Him to do what the church is called to do, we have got to start learning that when these things come, we have to be in constant hope for our Savior. We can't waver to and fro. We gotta have our hope in him. James says that a man who doubts when he prays shouldn't expect anything from God. Because his hope ain't in him all the way. It says he's like a wave tossed to and fro throughout the sea. This morning, let's put our hope in him. Let's put our hope in him. I'm gonna pray over you guys, and then we're gonna do an altar call. Because I wanna I, I, God wants to restore hope to some people's lives this morning. There's some people that came in here and they don't have hope anymore. They don't have joy anymore. And you've been putting all the right effort in all the wrong places. 
And God saying, Jesus being the ever loving God that He is, is standing down here this morning with arms wide open saying, Just come to me. Don't argue it. Don't try to talk your way out of my love and forgiveness. It's right here. You come take it. Because His faithfulness is non negotiable, His mercy is non negotiable. It's there. All you got to do is pick it up. If you would, bow with me.